All right. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be talking about whale love today. We'll be focusing a lot on parent and calf relationships for different whale species. And we also have a super fun Zentangle activity plan for the day. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Katie to get us started. Awesome. Hi, guys. Thanks for coming today. Okay, let me share my screen really quick. <clears throat> Out of curiosity, Trevor, what, what did the results say? Did we have a lot of first timers? I'm sorry, one second. Sharing screen kind of got that. I don't know where that poll went. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's OK. <laughs> Didn't mean to take you off guard there. I can go ahead and get started. All right, guys, like Trevor said, we're going to be talking about whale love today. And if you are here to talk about romance, it's not that kind of love today. We're going to be talking mostly about family love within whales. Right here, really quick, we've got a picture of some orcas. And then over here, you guys may or may not know, those are gray whales. So in order to talk about whales and their families, we need to know some facts. First of all, most of you probably know this, but whales are mammals, so they are born alive. And that also means that they need air to breathe. They can't breathe in the water like fish can. Baby whales are called calves. And when they are born, whales come out usually tail first. And the reason for this is because sometimes it takes a while for them to be born. And we want to make sure, or they want to make sure, that they don't take their first breath until they can get to the surface. Because actually, just like us, they can actually drown. So they got to make sure that they don't take that first breath until they're ready to do so. And unlike us, they have to learn to swim right away. This would be like us learning to walk as soon as we're born. But when we're born, we can breathe the air and the, in the area that we're born in, but they can't. They have to make sure they can get to the surface. So mom might nudge them up there the first couple of times, but they really got to figure out how to swim really quickly. And you may not have thought about this before, but now that you're thinking about it, Whales don't have lips like we do, so they can't suck. Like they, they couldn't drink out of a straw like we do. So when um, calves are nursing from their mothers, they actually, mother has an, a mechanism to pump that milk right into the calf's mouth instead of them, them having to suck it. So now we're just gonna talk about some differences and similarities between some of our, you know, some different species. A lot of these are ones that we see here in the Salish Sea. Um, this top one's an orca, obviously. And then we have a sperm whale, a humpback whale, and the bottom one's a gray whale. The first group of numbers is how long they nurse. So that just means how long that they need to drink mom's milk. <clears throat> and you see in these top two, the orca and the sperm whale, it's between one and two years long, which is a pretty long time. And the bottom two, it's a little shorter. So for the humpback, they nurse for about a year. And in a gray whale, they nurse for about six to eight months. And if you can kind of see, you'll see a little bit of a pattern. These top two, the orca and the sperm whale, they have a lot more in common than the humpback and the gray whale do. Um, and that's most likely because these top two are toothed whales. They're in the toothed whale category. And the humpback and the gray whale are in the baleen whale category. So you'll see some more similarities. So this next one, this is just a fancy word for how long um, a baby is inside its mom before it's born. So gestation means you know pregnancy time. So in these top two, the orcas are pregnant for about 18 months, which is a crazy amount of time. That's about double what, um, how long, humans are. So that's a long time to think about being pregnant. And the same with the sperm whale, between 14 and 16 months is a pretty long time. Um, the humpback whale and the gray whale are between 11 and 12 months. And that's still longer than human babies, but it's a lot shorter than the orca. And then finally, 
we have the time between births. So this also kind of matches how long they're pregnant and how long they nurse. So if you look at that with the orca and the sperm whale, they have to nurse those babies for up to two years, and then they're pregnant for another year and a half. So that kind of tells you why it's so long between the times when they have their babies. So with orcas, it can be five years between babies. And with sperm whales, five to seven years, which is a really long time. So orcas and sperm whales don't have a lot of babies throughout their life, um, as opposed to humpbacks and gray whales, who can have a baby every, every other year even. So they can have many calves throughout their lifespans. This actually becomes important when you're talking about when um, just like our local population of orcas, the southern resident orcas, they're endangered. Um, it takes them a lot longer to bounce back from things like, um, you know, interruptions in their food sources because they don't even have babies that often during normal years. All right, now we get to talk about some cute stuff between whales and their babies. First of all, orcas, we probably, most of us know that they live in strongly bonded family groups called pods. And those pods are um, broken up between matrilines, which just means that um, the mothers lead the groups. In these pods, they really do a very good job of taking care of each other. So often the aunts and the sisters and sometimes the uncles and especially the grandmothers will help care for the babies. And not only will they help care for the calves, but there's also been some evidence that they actually will help baby orcas be born, which is pretty incredible. That's how much they rely on their families. And here's a fun fact. Um, mother orcas actually stay with their adult sons their whole life. The adult sons hang out with them their entire lives. And a mother orca will actually still keep feeding her adult son orca. So that's interesting. Even though they're way beyond needing to be fed, it's so important to those mothers to make sure that their sons are fed, that they still keep feeding them. Orcas are found in every ocean in the world, and they're every single type of orca has different culture and feeding behaviors and patterns and traditions. That means they all have some pretty unique ways of hunting. Um, there is actually a pod, it's a pretty small pod in Argentina that teaches their calves to be stranders. If you don't know what a strander is, a stranding, stranding is when an, a whale ends up on the beach when they're not supposed to be, and that could usually mean a bad thing. But this pod of orcas actually teaches their calves to purposely strand themselves so in order to get um, a specific type of seal that they like that lives on the beaches there. But they can't just you know, tell the baby orcas to do that and expect them to be able to pull it off. They actually have to teach them and they teach them by showing them over and over again and then having them try it on their own. But they don't start teaching them with live prey. They actually, if you look over here in this picture, this mama has some kelp in her mouth and that's what she's doing. She's using kelp because it doesn't move to give that baby a chance to learn how to get on the beach, grab the the kelp and then get off of the beach without getting stuck. And then they slowly um, increase that into the live prey. So this is a really cool way that moms teach their babies. Um, another really neat story about orcas and supporting their family members was with this big orca, Tumbo, who's on the bottom here. He was, his number is T2C2, but he was called Tumbo. And he was an orca that was born with scoliosis. And what scoliosis is, is a, it's a genetic disorder where the, the back is a lot more curved than it should be. His was so curved. I wish we had a better picture of his back here, but his was so curved that it actually curved in his dorsal fin here too. Um, but it was so curved that it really slowed him down. He wasn't able to keep up like a normal orca would. However, his family bond was so strong that they made sure that he was always fed. In fact, some researchers were able to put a, a hydrophone in the water, which is just an underwater microphone, and they were able to hear him communicating with his family, even when they were far away. They always made sure that he was keeping up with him and that he knew where they were while they were hunting, since he couldn't keep up for the hunt. And then they would bring back pieces for him. 
they were so bonded that they actually helped Tumbo to live to 14. And that's really long for an orca who has scoliosis. And that was all due to the love from his family. All right, now we're gonna switch gears into humpbacks. Um, this first thing is a position we call echelon. Um, this position isn't just for humpbacks. A lot of whales use this position, but humpbacks are really good at it. And if you look at the picture, that baby right there is in the echelon position. And what that means is they're kind of, they're tucked underneath this fin, this pectoral fin, but also along mom's side because that puts the baby in the slipstream. And what that really means is there's less force from the water where that is. Mom's body kind of takes the force of the water so that baby has an easier time swimming. It does make it harder for mom though so she's putting in a lot of work to make it easier for the baby. Um, this position of echelon isn't just important though for making it easier for the baby to swim. It's also to keep them safe. Um, a lot of times with the baleen whales, they actually, the, the calves are kind of vulnerable. There's a, there's a whale out there that sometimes prey on baby baleen whales. So let's keep them close to mom where they can contact and, and touch them and know that they're near and safe from prey. Um, predators. This also is used in other whale species, including orcas, in prey sharing. So just like I was talking about the orca moms still feeding their adult sons, well, one really easy way for them to feed them is to break off the food in their mouth, and then they can just kind of shake it loose, and the food will, will actually go down that slipstream as well, right to where the baby can get it. So it's a good way to feed them and share food. One fun fact about humpbacks in a way that they love other species other than themselves is that they are known to be altruistic, which is a fancy word for, I don't know, I think of it as kind of like heroes. So they will get in the way sometimes between, um, let's say an orca or a seal um, and protect the seal from the orca. And it's been documented with other species too. And we're not really sure why they do that because it's not it's not very normal in the, the animal kingdom, but it seems that they have some sort of empathy for the critters. Humpbacks also teach a uh, feeding be behavior, just like the orcas were teaching them to strand and get seals. Humpbacks teach their babies a special feeding, be feeding behavior called bubble net feeding. I mean, you're gonna see my, my little silly graphic version of it on this page. <laughs> this is as good as I could do. Um, so basically, the humpback will teach their baby to do bubble net feeding, which um, humpbacks actually use in a cooperative way, which means that they will cooperate together with other humpback whales to get fish in a tighter ball, what we call a bait ball, which makes it a lot easier for them to get a good gulp with a lot of fish in it. So they'll teach their babies to do this. And it can be one or two whales, but it can be up to 20 whales doing this together. So the babies have to learn this skill. So they will start by blowing bubbles under the water, which is pretty cool. And they'll blow those bubbles in a big circle around the fish. And then they'll just keep getting tighter and tighter and tighter because it, it forces the fish, they're kind of afraid of the bubbles to go in the center. And they'll keep getting tighter until those fish are really balled up in the center. And then one whale or two whales or several whales will get underneath and they make a big scary sound and it scares the fish to the surface. And then they go for it and they all lunge feed. And that's what the picture before was showing was they open their mouths like that. And then they've got all of those fish in one place and they get a nice healthy bite out of it. And now we're gonna talk about gray whales, which these are pretty special to us here on Whidbey Island, especially this time of year, because we get a group of gray whales that come here just to feed and it's super cool. Um, but they're also really good moms and they do a lot of sacrificing for their babies. So gray whale mothers can lose up to 30% of their body weight just nursing their calves alone. And a lot of that is because they have to create, a, they have to use a ton of energy to create really fatty milk for these babies because they have to grow really fast because they have to get ready to do a really long journey, pretty much right after they're weaned. 
So in order to do that, they've got to be pretty big already because we already talked about there, there's some dangers along the way, but it's also a really long trek. So these gray whales will do all of this feeding up here in the north during the summer, up here in the Bering Sea. And then they take a 5,000 to almost 7,000 mile long journey, which is a crazy long time. They have the longest whale migration. And they're going to go all the way back down. See, this is Alaska. I'll give you a little perspective here. This is Canada. This is tiny little Washington where we are. It's tiny on this map. And Oregon and California. And they go all the way down here to this funny little finger here that's called Baja, Baja, Mexico. And these little dips over here that look like little pools, those are lagoons. And they come down here to have their babies because these lagoons are warm and they're safe from a lot of predators and there's not a lot of boat activity. So this is where they, they decide to have their babies. And then once they've had these babies, they have to nurse them. And remember we said they, they nurse them for about six to eight months. And then those babies have to be ready to make that entire journey all the way back up to these waters up in Alaska. So they have to have enough fat on them to make that journey, which is why mom has to make so much milk in the beginning. However, the crazy thing about gray whale moms is they do a lot of this journey on just those su that summer feeding food in their stomach and their, their fat stores and their blubber. So they're pretty incredible that they can do all that without eating a ton. Another kind of um, love between whales is called alloparental care. And this is just a really fancy word for whale babysitters. So we know that several whale species use babysitters, but two of the more well-known ones are sperm whales and pilot whales. And they'll actually leave their calves in big groups on the surface while they go hunt. Um, so we know that the, even though they live in tight structures and they stay around their moms, um, they also use each other for help. And there's another thing that gray whales do that I think is pretty special. When they're down in those lagoons, um, like I said, moms, really, really tired. She's done that whole journey. She's doing all that nursing. And gray whale babies are very, they like a lot of attention. So moms need some rest sometimes. They will put the babies in the middle of the lagoon in like a play group. Like they have, they're having a play date so that they can entertain each other for a while. And then mom can get some rest. And lastly, I can't see you guys, but I hope somebody sees him. Um, Lastly, we have an example of whales accepting whales from other species. So not just their own and not just like their nephews and nieces, but an entire different species. There was a, there's a pretty well-known pod of beluga whales that live on the east side of Canada. So over on the other side of, of the country, closer to where our friends from DC live um, in the St. Lawrence estuary. And those belugas, they were observing them and noticed there was somebody hanging out with them that looked a little bit different. He was a little bit differently colored. And it turned out it was a young whale narwhal. And we don't know why he lost his family or got separated, but uh, he decided to adopt this pod of belugas and they decided to adopt him back. And he um, is still being seen with them. It's a little bit of a mystery what will happen as he gets older because he was younger and as he matures. But very interesting that they decided that um, to adopt him, um, even though he's not even their kind of species. All right, and then I'm just gonna leave you with this lovely little picture. We get a lot of gray whales around Whidbey Island. And what we tell people when they're looking out from our shores is how to tell it's a gray whale is they have a heart-shaped blow, as you see right here. And so I wanted you guys to see that gray whales also celebrate Valentine's Day. All right, and I am all done. Thanks for listening, guys. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Should I type it in the chat? Oh, you can just ask it out loud. Okay. Um, and I'll I just like, I wanted to know, because you said that boy baby whales will stay with their moms for a really long time. But how about the girls? Do they stay with them forever too? They don't always. It, it depends on the type of orca. Sometimes they break off and they start their own pods, like in our transient orcas, the, the bigs type. 
um, but sometimes they also stay with their mothers and their grandmothers. Um, but the boys always stay and they stay there their whole lives. So they never build their own pod? No, they don't ever build their own pod. We do have some special circumstances where some orcas will just travel on their own for whatever reason, or they will go try out a, a different family group, but they don't build their own pods. That's a good question. Any other questions? Oh, um, how long do the sperm whales live? Oh, that is a really good question. That is a, I don't know the answer to that, but we should Google that. That's what we do when we can't find the answer. <laughs> <laughs> On it. <laughs> Trevor, do you know how long sperm whales live? And it's not off the top of my head, which I should know because <laughs> they're one of my favorites too. <laughs> we also have Cindy on a call, looks like, and she might be able to answer that question. We don't specialize in sperm whales out here because we don't see them very often. It's still cool. What? But it's still cold there. Yes. So it looks like the typical lifespan is about 70 years on sperm. That's a long time. Yeah. It's a long time. They're very similar to orcas. That's cool. Also a good question. Anybody and else? Throwing some extra fun facts here. They get about 52 feet in length and they can weigh up to uh, 90,000 pounds. <laughs> That's very big. Well, I think we're going to have to find a sperm whale presenter to come do a sperm whale presentation. I'm inspired. <laughs> that sounds fun. <laughs> we did have a, since I've lived here, there was a sperm whale north of here because I remember they were talking about hearing it on the hydrophones. They're just pretty rare in this area. But it'd be really cool to find out more about them. Yeah, one of my favorite types of whales. I think, yeah, this is definitely a blue whale oh yes we also love blue whales we also we do not get blue whales here but we do get fin whales around here and fin whales are the second largest whale they're pretty incredible though i would have always said it would be like a sperm whale or a humpback whale not a mm -hmm. fin whale that's no i haven't even heard of that one before a lot of people haven't even though they're the second largest they kind of get um their light um, stolen by the blue whale. <laughs> they look very similar. They're a little more torpedo shaped. They're very interesting though. Um, Eric, I saw your question. Um, I they, they are named after the type of oil um, or the substance that's in their melon, but I can't pronounce it. Trevor, do you have that fact up <laughs> open? <laughs> I do think we're going to have to do a sperm whale. You guys have given me inspiration that we are going to find somebody to talk about sperm whales. And then we'll get all of your, your questions answered. Cool. It's called spermaceti oil. Thank you, Cindy. Thanks, Cindy. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I always get very fascinated by them since I know they dive down deep into the ocean and they they like to eat giant squid, which it's hard to fathom going down, diving thousands of feet just to wrangle with these massive squids as big as you are, or bigger. I don't know how they would see them since it's so dark. Which is also a really fascinating subject. <laughs> We're going to... Yeah, I think I think we'll put a pin in the sperm whale thing and you come back looking for a youth event in our future <laughs> for sperm whales because I think we need to have a whole event dedicated to them. Because we talk about a lot of different whales, but um, we need to branch out to some of the species that we don't see as often around um, Whidbey Island because a lot of you are in different areas. I didn't get to see the pole, but um, I know at least yeah, some families on the East Coast Something happened with the poll. It wouldn't let me submit it because oh. one of the questions was like, if you live in Washington, D.C. or something. So I had to answer it all three, but I did um, put it in the chat. Awesome. Well, thank you for that.
Okay, is everybody ready to move on to the activity? Yes. Give me a thumbs up or I think you can do a virtual thumbs up too, can't you guys? <laughs> awesome. So I have a couple questions. Did you print out the activity? Yes, the Zentangle. And, oh, yay, see, I knew you could do emoji thumbs up. Um, also, how many of you have already filled it out? Already done your activity? Okay, so we can do it together. Awesome, that's why I asked. All right, well, so first of all, this is a technique called Zentangle. And this was brought to us by um, somebody who you guys have maybe seen before. Her name is Jeannie. She's been on our youth events before. Um, she used to work at the Well Center and now she is doing all kinds of fun traveling. Um, but this is what she does. She's certified to do these. So she made this worksheet for us. And it's actually very a very special technique. And sometime I hope to have Jeannie walk you guys through it um, live because it's really relaxing when she does it. It's almost like doodling combined with meditation. It's super cool. So if you wanna get out your, this worksheet, this is gonna be your template. Ooh, can we see that? Oh, it's cause I have the background thing on, huh? <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> okay. And then your sample Zentangle patterns. So what Jeannie did is she just gave you guys some ideas of patterns. And you'll see that each pattern has a name. Well, not all of them, but most of them do. And these are actually like there's a big Zentangle Art Institute where they name each one of these designs. And that name sticks with that design. So these are they're, they're more serious than they look. <laughs> um, but the whole idea with Zentangle is so that you can take doodling and make something really cool out of it without having to have any background or specific talent or ability. And that's what I love about Zentangle because it's just repeating patterns over and over again. And then you come, when it's over, you get a really cool outcome. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is look at your template and you'll see that she kind of divided up the gray well with some lines. And that's just a map. And that's just to kind of encourage you to use different designs in each piece of the map. So you'll pick some designs and you can also do whatever you want. You can do your own doodle inside there. But what's really cool is you can combine these things. And I'm gonna show you guys a sample that I did because I've taken Jeannie's class before. So I've done a couple of these before. Oh, this is gonna, let me see if I can change my view. How do I take my background? There we go. Does that help? <laughs> there we go. We can see it a little better now, right? So you see how I took the, so what's the one with the spirals? It's called print temps spirals, right? And I just, started putting them on top of each other because that's one thing she taught us to do we they don't they can actually be layered so you can put some in front and some behind each other and the same thing with the bubbles you can overlap them i don't know if you guys can see that and sometimes that makes the bubbles pop out a little bit more so go, go ahead and try some of those designs and put them in your little map the great thing about zentangle is no matter what, it's gonna end up awesome. And you don't have to worry about judging your art or, or how it's gonna turn out. So go ahead and start. If you have a black pen, that's usually the best or a pencil. Cause then you can go back and add color later and the color even makes it cooler. So I'll show you mine again, but I don't want you guys to get caught up on what mine looks like or what the example one looked like cause they should all be different and you wanna do exactly what you want. So I also use that crescent moon design and put them on top of each other too. So you can get creative even with what she gave you. And I used, what was it called? Oh, that one didn't have a name. They kind of look like hot air balloons in the waves. And then when I colored them, it made them look even cooler. What I like about the bubble designs, which is the tipple, 
the orbs is that they kind of look like the gray well barnacles the the spots they get on them so that's kind of fun and you can even get fun with the uh the frame part of it i sent your parents or whoever's email it was Jeannie's sample can you see what she did with her frame she kind of zebraed it and what I like what she did with her orbs is she colored in in between her orbs, which made it look even more like it was part of the gray well. But you can make these lines, what ones are those called? The holly bow, the diagonal lines, look like they're going through each other. You see that? And she didn't do, she put her spirals next to each other, not behind each other or in front of each other. And that also worked. So I'm going to let you guys just kind of work on them. And then if you have questions about how to do something, maybe I can help. We'll see if I can help. Because I do want to see as you guys, um, as it starts coming together, what that looks like. I just saw somebody making a heart symbol. Hearts would be really cool inside one of these designs too. You can do anything you want. That's what's so cool about these. So I'm going to throw one more idea at you because it is gray whale season here and we are celebrating gray whales at the Langley Well Center. If you want to, and if you have somebody in your family who can scan or take a picture of your finished product, of your finished art, we would love to put them up in the whale center to celebrate gray whales. And all you have to do, just take a picture, or have them scan it in on the computer and then your parents should have my email. It's katie at orcanetwork.org and you can email it to me. I would love to put those up. Oh, Anna, that's awesome. Oh, wow. Can you put it closer so we can see kind of some of the details you did? Look at the color. See how much the color actually spices it up too? That's awesome. Thanks. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. So yeah, and if you don't have a scanner, that's okay. Just have your um, your adult take a picture of it and email it to me because I can print them out. And you can take your time too. You don't have to finish them today. Yeah, I'm definitely noticing it takes a bit of time. <laughs> it's like well, I think I just finished checkerboarding my up, oh, but same issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the virtual backgrounds don't work work very well for the for the drawings. They don't like faces. Yeah, and you really should take your time because one of the fun parts of Zentangle is kind of just getting in into your imagination with it. It's supposed to be fun which sometimes rushing doesn't make things fun, so. Did anybody make up their own design? I'm really curious. I did. Awesome, can you share it? So you don't have to, but... Some of the ones here, I did this sort of like uh, quilt pattern. Yeah. And I thought that kind of a spot would be good in there too. That's very cool. I love that. I didn't make up any of my own, but maybe I'm not finished with mine either. Maybe I, I'll do that later. I've got a part of my heart coming along. Ooh, I like that. And you don't have to be finished to share yours either.
I do think we'll have to, well, we have two ideas that came out of this. I think we're going to have to do a sperm whale youth event, but I also think we will definitely need to get Jeannie here to do a Zantangle with you guys live because she also can do it. She has a, a fun camera where you can see her drawing while she's drawing. And that's really helpful too. And while you guys are doodling, just so that you know, in March, we will be having a youth event all about porpoises, which I don't think we've done porpoises before. So I'm really excited about that. And then in April, be on the lookout. We're gonna be sharing some videos on how to make whale costumes. And then I think if I'm not, Cindy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're gonna to get to see some gray whale footage in April as well, the video. Yes, we are virtual whale watch. Awesome. And did you guys catch that? I think it was a little broken up. We're gonna to get to do a virtual gray whale watch in April. Ooh, I like your designs, Eric. Very cool. This is what I have so far, but I'm gonna have this sort of blanket pattern go over. Wow, you're even doing the background. See, you can do so much with these. Oh, and I like that, Colin. Very cool. You guys are doing a great job with this. You know exactly what you're doing. How many of you live near Whidbey Island? Or in the Puget Sound area? Any of you? <laughs> Colin, that was a great entrance. <laughs> are you on a rolling chair? Or are you just the flash? <laughs> well, if you happen to be in the area of the Langley Well Center in April, we, uh, we do have a really fun um, parade and festival called Welcome the Whales. And that's when we officially welcome the gray whales to the area. And it's super duper fun if you want to come. This year, it's going to be on April 15th. Is that right, guys? <laughs> Check me. <laughs> Saturday, April 15th. Lily and Clara and Willa, how are you guys coming on your Zentangles? Is it going okay? Ooh, awesome. You're doing great. This Does is anybody Colin's else want to show? Hi, this is Colin's dad. I'm wondering if you guys saw the video of the cruise boat with the hundred fin whales. It was a National Geographic thing. With a cruise boat with what? Uh, it's a cruise, a uh, National Geographic cruise boat, and there was hundreds of fin whales. Oh, I did not. I saw that earlier this week. I'm not sure you came across. Well, that sounds like amazing. I did not see that. Fin whales are really curious now. Yeah. <laughs> Something to Google later. <laughs> Do you know where they were filmed at? He may have left, huh, Colin? They waited too long. Well, Hold on. I'm looking. <laughs> that sounds like an Antarctica location. Yeah, it looks like it was observed off a cruise ship that was uh, taking passengers to Antarctica. Wow. 
we probably would never see that many fin whales around here, but that sounds incredible. Hi, Rosie. Ooh, more progress. Oh, goodness, that's awesome. I think the more colors, the better, because that makes it all look even more textured. I kind of gave up on mine because I was too busy watching you guys. Is anybody using the crescent moons yet? I use the crescent moon on some of my waves. Um, nice. But I seem to, uh, <laughs> the parallel lines one was a little bit more challenging. And I think I might have crossed over in a couple of places I shouldn't have. So. But that's the thing about Zentangle. You can't actually make a mistake. It is what it's supposed to be. <laughs> I like I like the name of the Knights Bridge. I, I just like the name of it. So I'm gonna have to use that somewhere. Oh yeah, there's your crescent moon. I see it. That's awesome. Mm -mm. Wish I had some color. All I brought with me is just the pen. <laughs> All right, guys. I think we'll probably give like two more minutes and then. You guys can go work on your own. I don't want to rush you guys or anything. And then if you have any questions about how to get me your finished product, um, your parents got an email from me this week um, when you registered. So they can just shoot me an email. Thanks, Corbin. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next time. Oh, my goodness. You work fast, Emma. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks, David. We'll see you next time. I actually found the uh, octopus. Did you find the octopus? Did everybody? Yeah. I, I realized that when you're presenting, you can't see everybody's squiggly hands. I kind of missed that. <laughs> Did you all see him? He was adopted by a pod of belugas as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like Emma put down octopus when it was going through there. Nice. The chat. Do yeah. you know why we make this signal? Because it kind of looks like an octopus's tentacles. It does. And it actually comes from the diving signals of octopuses. Because you know, when you're underwater, you can't talk to each other. So in order to alert another diver of an octopus, you actually use this signal. I did um, here when you said to do the thingy, so I was just like, hmm, I'll just do an emoji and say that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that works too. <laughs> All right, last call for any sharing. Yes, go ahead and unmute. Today I was on the water and I um, saw a bunch of sea turtles. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Are you, are you guys not home? We're in Turks and Caicos right now. Oh, that's awesome. I was going to say, I don't remember sea turtles in DC in the winter. <laughs> that's so cool. Good for you. Were they cool? Mm -hmm. Were they adorable? Yeah. Oh, we'll have so much fun there. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, Trevor, I think we might be ready. All right. Well, thank you so much for everyone, to everyone for joining us today. It was tons of fun to have all of you. And again, you all have very impressive Zentangle skills right from the get-go. So um, yeah, thank you so much for visiting and um, we'll see everybody next month for the next one.
See you for porpoises in March. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.